Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Now let's move to Off the Press, where we have a quick review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. We're starting with the Punch newspapers. Should be in your screen in just a few seconds. And of course, I will be introducing our guest, Tunde Kolawale, once again. The big one on the Punch this morning, it's uh, speaking concerning the uh, ransom payment. It says that uh, Kaduna bandits collect 50 million naira ransom hold back 87 students, and that's uh, Baptist school students. 28 students released, proprietor says, bandits to free others in batches. Niger pupils spend 54 days in captivity. FGC Kebi students, 40 days. Also, federal government extends NIN SIM linkage to October. 59.8 million uh, enrolled. Also this morning, Bakari Lampoon's unnamed official says change of button imminent. Beans, tomatoes, rice, record 253%, 123%, and 51% 50, price hike. Experts worry as 221 inbound passengers test positive in three weeks. Also on the pond this morning, PDP governors meet today on defections, electoral act amendment, and others. Fiscally challenged girl threatens suicide, says parents and cleric call me demon-possessed. Also, APC Claire's chairmanship seats in Ogun. Last year holds Lagos results. Fifteen corpses recovered, four missing as flood washes away stock boss. And the last one on the point this morning, Buhari's gag order on terror, on terror reporting illegal, Serap tells court. Away from the punch, let's go to the nation newspapers this morning. Federal government demands nothing short of Igboho's extradition. Nigeria is set for diplomatic showdown if Benin Republic declines. Also, JAM remits 2 billion naira to the federal government. North lacks leadership, says Matawale. And also, APC sweeps Lagos and Ogun Council polls. NCDC, 69 die of COVID-19 in 11 weeks. Still on the nation, Nigerians' uh, economic outlook still slippery. And uh, reps issue bench warrant on Emefiele and Kiari. A few others on the nation newspapers this morning. Resumed Kano trial raises anxiety in Abuja. And 28 freed Kaduna pupils reunite with parents. Kinsmen to testify against ex-JAM boss Ojerinde in 5.2 billion naira fraud trial. Away from the nation now, let's go to the Daily Trust and see what we can quickly also throw in there. Kidnappers in FCT begin collection of ransom through banks. How we're made to make a deposits, and that's from victims' relatives. Banks not helping matters, says victims, and of course, so what the government is doing also. 25 die in Kano, Bauchi road crashes. Benin court, a Bene court, I beg your pardon, decides Igboho's fate today as Kano appears in Abuja court. Counterinsurgency, 265 policemen killed in Borno. And ASU threatens strike over federal government's failure to implement agreement. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, have uh, just a few in the Daily Sun newspapers this morning. INEC, NSA, Army and others in 76 billion naira illegal loan scandal. Auditor General's report exposes how agencies borrowed money from government accounts without repayment. Tension as Kano's trial begins in Abuja. Lawyers warn against stopping supporters from attending proceedings. Um, Igboho's trial, Lubadon sends delegation to Kotonou. And also Kaduna, parents of uh, kidnapped uh, school children narrate ordeals. On as a flares IPOB, IPOB's attack on Edwin Clark. I, I think we'll stop there and quickly say good morning to our guest, uh, Tunde Kolawale. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, my brother. Thanks again, well, thanks again for having me. Absolutely. There's a, a very interesting story. I think we can start from the uh, uh, issue with uh, Kad in Kaduna State, where 28 freed students uh, have uh, reunited with their parents. Uh, there is, of course, some celebration, but at the same time, there's you know also uh, a deadlock with regards to that one, as uh, some of the students, 87 of them, are still being held in captivity. Honestly speaking, my brother, as I'm looking at the front pages of all the papers, seeing the condition in which all those students who have been released are, and also the gnashing of teeth from the parents 
relations and the authorities of the school where these children have been kidnapped. My heart has been bleeding. Like I've always said, and I will continue to say, there's no justification whatsoever for any of our children not to be able to go to school without the fear of being kidnapped. The technologies are there for us to be able to protect these children. Furthermore, the Nigerian security forces have demonstrated in the recent times that they have the capacity to unravel very noisy security issues, such as we have seen in the kidnap of Namidikano, the trailing of person they go all the way to Kotonu, and the continuous uh, trailing of DJ Switch, one of the leaders of um, the entrance uh, movement. It is just that the authorities don't appear to be too interested in nipping this incessant kidnapping of our children in the respective schools in the board. More indictments should equally or should go to the governor of um, Kaduna State, Malam Nasir uh, Wufai. If you as a government say you are not going to be paying ransom for the release of anybody kidnapped in the state, then you must have a master plan on ground to ensure that nobody is kidnapped. And that if anybody is kidnapped, you have a rescue team to be able to bring back whoever may be kidnapped and also bring their kidnappers to justice. But Malam Nasi Rufai doesn't have any of this. And if he insisting that the government will not pay ransom. So we are in a conundrum. I have very strong suspicion that this kidnapping is no longer just business enterprise as people have been painting it. I strongly suspect that it is the Islamic fundamentalist that behind this kidnapping as a way of raising money to buy arms and ammunition and also to enforce their desire, their decision, and their determination that children will not, that children of Northern Nigeria will not get formal education because they have always believed that Western education is around, is forbidden, it shouldn't be tolerated. We as Nigerians now owe all our children a duty to put pressure on the Kaduna state government and the federal government to do the needful with regard to the security of life and property of our children, we are, I mean, so that they will not be kidnapped. Because what is at stake today, it is the future of the nation. All these children that have been aroused, that have been kidnapped, that have been traumatized, are the ones that are expected to be leaders of tomorrow. So if they are not educated, how would they be able to take on leadership responsibility right. in the future? Right. If they are traumatized, what attitude would they have to like? Right. If Mr. at the very let, in which they are, they see corpses, they see people being killed, what attitude would they have to human life when they do grow up? The country oh. is in a very, very serious conundrum. And the earlier we as a people find solution to this tragedy, the better for us all. All right, Mr. Kolawale, let's move away from that. Uh, of course, we'll have a, uh, you know, an extended conversation about that later. Um, there's also other stories. Uh, there's uh, the price of uh, food items. It says beans, tomatoes, and uh, rice record 253%. 123% and 51% um, uh, price hike. Um, how are Nigerians dealing with, you know, this new increment in food prices? Well, from my own personal experience, I would want to say there was a time, you remember during the Second Republic, in which the opposition party, which was the unity party of Nigeria, uh, cried out, that um, Nigerians were starving, and that the economy of the nation was about to hit the rock. 
and that uh, the NP and the National Party of Nigeria, headed by Alajisev uh, Shagari, require to do something about all of those things, especially to provide food security for our people. And I remember Alajisev like, Rudiko, one of the strong men of the National Party of Nigeria that period in time, and the minister, saying that how could anyone have said that when Nigerians have not begun to eat from the dustbin? I have personally been seeing old women, children rummaging through the dustbin in front of my house on a daily basis to scavenge for what they would eat. And I am sure these old people, these children are doing this because they can no longer afford to go to the market and buy the staple food that they used to buy because of the skyrocketing prices. Gary has almost, uh, the prices of uh, Gary has almost uh, uh, increased a thousand fold. Even locally made rice is more expensive now than the imported one. I personally still don't remember when last I had beans because we discovered that the prices of things have uh, uh, dramatically uh, gone up. And you see, a nation that is unable to provide food for itself is sitting on the keg of gunpowder. Because food security is even more important than any other security that you may talk about. Because once the people are hungry, they will be angry. And once they are angry, they are likely to be unruly. And once they are unruly, they might be taking laws into their hands and engaging in self-help and criminality. And that is the reason why we must also see a kind of connection, a kind of corollary relationship between the insecurity that we have all over the country today and the food insecurity that is prevalent all over Nigeria. And it is a tragedy that a country that is arable, that almost 100% of its land uh, you can use for agriculture, that people can still begin to suffer this kind of food security, uh, scarcity. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. And you could almost expect, you could, you could see it coming, when farmers can no longer go to the farm, when farmers have to allow the security people that they want to go and plant, when farmers have to pay taxes to bandits, and to Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists that have littered their place. The truth of the matter is that this government is incompetent. It no longer has the justification to remain in power for any day long. Because according to the Constitution, any government that cannot protect the lives of its citizens and their property, which is the primary responsibility of government, has no business in governance. All right. Let's move over to the uh, controversy concerning Sunday Igboho. The Nation uh, reports this morning the federal government demands nothing short of uh, Igboho's extradition. Um, and it says uh, the possibility of a diplomatic showdown if Benin Republic uh, declines. Um, how, how do you see this playing out? Well, it's a continuation of the domestic impunity that we used to see at home that the the government in power now wants to take across the border to a foreign nation. The Republic may be a tiny country, but I also know that they are a country that are well organized and that have some semblance of respect for the rule of law. The thinking of the Nigerian authorities is that uh, the Middle Eastern day ago was arrested in the airport or stopped by the immigration people they will just, the immigration people and the police will just deliver him to the Nigerian authorities who already put an helicopter on gun to fly him back to Nigeria. But the people are saying, no, let's follow the due process of the law. Let's hear his own explanation for coming into our country or for trying to run away to Germany. And that is the basic principle of fair hearing. And Nigerian authorities, if they have a case Sunday for war, they will go to the Beninian court and make their own case. Sunday Bowo will make their own case. And the judge will give a ruling whether to extradite him back to Nigeria or to allow him to continue his journey all the way to Germany. But it would appear to me that they are not ready to do this. I won't be surprised 
if the Nigerian authorities do the kind of thing that they did when armed robbers allegedly attacked the Yabo passenger and stole from Veku when the Yabo passenger was in Nigeria, and I think he was a senator. You remember passenger immediately closed uh, the boundary between Nigeria and uh, uh, Benin Republic and some of these other countries and all that, and refused to allow most of the things that these people come to Nigeria to buy, to go out across the border, a kind of an attempt to suffocate them economically. And it was when the suffocation was getting out of hand, the man who was mostly responsible for the cross-border mob who comes all the way from the Republic to rob in Nigeria and take the vehicle back to the Republic was surrendered to the Nigerian authorities. And then without being tried, the man was done in Kirikiri prison. I don't know what has become you know, of his face now. Maybe he's still alive or he's, uh, or he's dead. So in the near, very near future, in a few days, few weeks, we might be seeing high-handed action on the part of the Nigerian authorities to put pressure on the Benin Republic uh, government to surrender Sunday go right. without following the due Finally. process of the law. But F you see, Finally, uh, Mr. Godaudi, I must also say, I am not too happy yeah. with the disposition of the Yoruba leaders, with the disposition of the, so the freedom fighters, and with the disposition of even the Yoruba people in the Republic, because I am told 30% of the people in the Republic are Yoruba. Their attitude to this uh, illegal and unlawful defense of Sunday Bowo is not too pleasing to me. All right, um, Mr. Kolawole, let, let, let's, uh, let's take a massive, uh, massive let's put a pause there. And demonstration yeah. all over the place today. Let's, let's put a pause there, Mr. Kolawole. The can you hear me? Tony can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you now. Oh, okay, okay. Let, let's put a pause there um, because of time. I, I want us to wrap up, you know, with uh, talking about the APC sweeping Lagos and Ogun State in the local government elections on Saturday. Uh, some people, of course, uh, would say congratulations to them, but, you know, would you also say same? Mm -hmm. My brother, they say charity begins at home. They say charity begins at home. I repeat again, charity begins at home. You and I will know that the so-called Yoruba politicians and leaders have been the most rancorous on the call for true federalism, uh, uh, resource control, and what have you. In what way have we seen them repeat or do what they are asking the federal government to do with regards to the way and manner they manage their own respective states and their own domestic affairs? Is it possible in any sense society for just one political party all the time to win all the local government elections in the respective uh, uh, jurisdiction. You and I know that there are certain parts of Lagos that is usually the domain of the PDP, for example, the uh, Isolo, Oshodi area, all the way to Agboju, Fensak, and what have you. And from uh, part of uh, Ikorodu and Nepe, those people no longer have voters to vote for them in, the, in those places and all that. So the truth of the matter is that uh, these people who are calling for true federalism, who are calling for true democracy, who are calling for the rule of law, are themselves even more culpable than the federal government when it, when, um, it concerns issue of free and fair elections, issue of uh, devolution of power, issue of allowing the local government to function the way and manner they should be functioned. Even an uh, issue of allowing the judiciary, issue of allowing the legislature to function the way they should function and to have access to their money as a first line of charge without being squandered or manipulated or in any way squandered by the executive arm of going in respect of some of these uh, uh, states. The legal uh, local government election is even more tragic. Tragic in the sense that uh, I don't know whether this person is still there. LISEC, the local, the local election authorities in Lagos, is headed by a former 
chief judge of Lagos State. That is a person who should be concerned about the rule of law, about fairness, about free and fair election. So if under our jurisdiction, the party in power in Lagos State still sits all the local government seats in Lagos, you will begin to imagine what kind of chief judge was this person when she was presiding over the Lagos State Judiciary. All right. What kind of attitude does this person have to a free and fair election? What kind of uh, uh, attitude does this person have to a uh, fair hearing? So, we're back to square one. These people are just not really ready for democracy. All right. uh, they want to continue their kleptocratic uh, preoccupation that they have uh, perfected and legalized and okay, have exported to other parts of, uh, of uh, the country. I, I didn't bother to go out to vote because I saw this coming as just a waste of time. It's a futile effort. So even though I monitor the election in some of these places, Nigeria is just not ready for democracy. All right. To Nicola Wally, thank you so much for your time this Monday morning. Um, Thanks for we'll having me, enjoy my your brother. analysis. And good morning Hope to you. Hope you find again. yourself a company tomorrow. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good Take morning. care of yourself. All right. Stay with us. And it's one of the things that we will be talking about today, the relevance of the local government. Uh, that comes up sometime during the breakfast this morning. How many people did get to vote over the weekend? And what were your reasons for staying away from the electoral process. We'll have that conversation a, a lot later, but thanks to uh, Tunde Kolawale. We'll take a short break. When we come back, what happened on this day, June, uh, July 26th, many, many years ago? I'll be sharing with you.